So I'm going to pass it over to Ginny Trainer, Associate Curator at the Museum and one of the curators for the Paper Routes Women to Watch 2020 exhibition. Hi, Ginny. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, <clears throat> everyone. And hello, especially to Hey Young, our featured guest today. Um, I'm really excited um, for everyone to be here and to be able to hear directly from the artists because it's always um, I think so much more interesting um, to hear from the artists themselves rather than hear me drone on about them. Um, I am the associate curator at the museum, as Carolyn mentioned, and I am the co-curator along with my colleague Orin Zara of Paper Roots Women to Watch 2020. I'm sure most of you know that this exhibition has been postponed because of the pandemic. It was supposed to open in late June, um, but we are looking forward to and planning on opening in early October. Um, the museum has reopened with um, safety measures in place and visitors, visitors are coming. So we look forward to welcoming um, visitors who feel comfortable coming to see this exhibition in person. Um, I'm really happy to say that despite a lot of logistical challenges, all the artists that we wanted in the exhibition are going to be in the exhibition. Um, it was a little, <laughs> it was a little dicey there for a while. Um, you know, there are a lot of new challenges with this pandemic, but our, our checklist remains the same. And so we're really excited to bring these 22 artists who work in paper um, to the museum. Uh, I just want to introduce Hey Young, um, she has a very impressive bio. She holds two BFAs, one in painting and one in printmaking, both of which she received in Korea. She also holds a Master of Fine Arts from SUNY Buffalo. Hey Young has been Assistant Professor of Print Media at the University of Missouri in the Department of Art and Art History since 2013. Before that, um, she taught in the Department of Visual Studies at the University of Buffalo, as well as the Art and Media Division at Niagara County Community College. So she's got a wonderful teaching um, experience and background. Hang has also exhibited her work in many solo shows and countless group shows um, like Paper Roots. She's participated in artist residencies, both nationally and internationally, including Italy, Argentina, Korea. Um, so her, her practice is, is very global um, in many respects. And we'll hear from her today about the installation that's going up in Paper Roots, which is titled Tide. And um, I think one of the things that drew me and my co-curator Aureen to Hae Young's work was the fact that it's so um, it's so unexpected. And that's the thing we were looking for um, with these works in paper. We wanted it to be a really wide variety of, um, of objects, of scale, of, of color. And I think people will be really surprised when they walk into the exhibition and, and look around and say, oh my gosh, all of this is made out of paper. Um, and Hei Young's work is, um, fits very nicely into that. It's extraordinary, as you will see shortly. Um, so I will turn it over to you, Hei Young. And um, yeah, it, as Carolyn mentioned, if you have questions, um, she and I will be monitoring the, the chat function. And so I will um, communicate your questions as they come up to Hei Young. Thank you. Hi. Thanks. Thank uh, you. Thanks to Jeannie for the great introduction. And um, also, I want to thank to Aureen Jahura and all women to watch team at the National Museum of, of Women in the Arts. I also extend my thanks to Arlene Gayoso and Chris LeBeau and all uh, members of the uh, Greater Kansas City chapter uh, and their support for me to be here. Lastly, I want to send my special thanks to Erin Jedjik who uh, invited me to this amazing opportunity in the first place through a uh, regional paper roots exhibition at Kemper Museum. So let me share my screen with you guys to show my slides. And full screen. 
Can you see? Great. Awesome. So I want to start uh, with Kathy Colbert's etching image of woman and that child, since it's stuck uh, in my mind for a while, for for years throughout my childhood as an earliest artistic experience for me. I found uh, this image in my mother's diary when I was about seven years old. The tangible emotion and realism struck me. Uh, even at that early age, and it reminds me so much about my, of, of my mom who lost her son in the earlier years. After um, years later, I finally had a chance to learn about the image and artist Kathy Kovitz. And the most importantly, her story of becoming a, a visual activist to tell the horror and misery of the war uh, after losing her son, two sons in and two world wars. So I think this image um, molded my thoughts to understand art is a story of a uh, painful, realistic, and shamelessly honest visual tale about humans. I am a project pro uh, based artist who tend to embrace new medium and methods to fulfill each uh, proposed idea. Still, uh, my main interest in material stay with paper for many years. So today I'm going to uh, show you one print image, which is this one, and slides from uh, for uh, my uh, solo show or projects. So I hope we help you relate to my work better in some ways. This is print image among us. I think this is one of the critical uh, statement for me to present my uh, artistic purpose and struggles. I had an organic idea of um, creating an I, uh, image that can illustrate a collective sense of uh, belongings and closeness of a human where we can define and value ourselves only as a human without prejudice. So I started to photograph top to bottom figure um, uh, of you can see, uh, to mimic perspective us kind of facing and looking at each other. Uh, and then uh, uh, black and white drawing in the middle is made of a stone litho print, uh, which printed on the top of the digital image of human bodies. I was fascinated by how the human, um, shape in the center uh, emerged by the other bodies when I collaged and edited the uh, uh, body photographs layers. My next slides are from the installation and performance uh, exhibition of We Are, which took place at the Big Orbit Gallery in Buffalo, New York in 2010. Um, the series is this uh, is to study the concept of memory drawing as the viewer interacts the image of the human fit along with the foot washing performance. The drawing series consists of uh, graphite drawings. I think I completed 21 uh, different drawings on individual paper and on uh, garments that I made out of paper, up uh, Korean paper, uh, hanji and lithographs uh, printed onto nine yard long um, muslin sheets to build a strong structural insulation, as you can see in the uh, slide. For me, the paper is like a human skin, uh, which can hold and communicate human experiences and memories. Like we can um, find it uh, 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 books. During the research for this project, um, I became aware that food is a profound subject matter to observe and study as a figurative artist. Um, as well as, um, as we all know, uh, human feet are highly developed in the complex uh, structure of a human body. So feet are strong yet frazzle and wonderfully strange and sometimes uh, looked so hideous. But um, 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 they're most humble and I think also most mistreated body parts as well. 
to me, um, however, human feet connect to the memory of my mother. I had a struck by her coldness and lifeless uh, fifth figure due to her long-term terminal illness and her yellowed bony feet always wanted to be held um, or needed to be held and warmed. So I massaged and sometimes washed her feet many days to help her fall asleep or reduce her pain. It took me a long time to stay her side along with long conversation or sometime complete silence. So I felt like my feet became of hope and prayers uh, with my hands. Once I started drawing human feet, I had to request myself to wash them as I wash my mother's. So um, that's the reason that I, that I decided to create the performance uh, as well as the drawing series. So in the performance, I wanted to use my body as a drawing tool for the first time. The experience that I had were beyond my expectation. It started as an experimental performance as I seek to create a participative uh, uh, performance arts format. Uh, still, the body, uh, the movement of my body tr transcended me uh, to the people's hearts with my hands and uh, that simple elements of water. So it was most extraordinary and awakening uh, experience for me as an artist and uh, as well as individual. This is the view from Weight of Being, uh, which showed at Anderson Gallery, Buffalo, New York in 2013. The installation consists of 32 fit cast from 32 individuals and bottom figures of fit photographs. Um, when I started thinking about this project, I just got out of my grad school and I was desperate for finding a job as an artist and as a mom of a middle schooler and I struggle with this uh, kind of feeling of heaviness of life and lightness of my own being in me uh, at the same time. So I think I simply just tried to find a way to produce artwork that uh, has a corporeal sense and representation of being human uh, in both means of lightness and heaviness. So I chose to create fit cast with Gempi paper, um, one of the lightest paper, uh, I think, in the world, uh, to portray lightness of being and chose to create photographs uh, of people's bottom feet to depict the heaviness of life. For uh, capturing the fit uh, image from the bottom, I had to build some types of like uh, sturdy structural um, you know, furniture. So I built a 20 by 20 inches glass top table with half inch thick tempered glass to create a safe surface for my uh, participant to stay on, uh, stand on for shooting. Uh, table also uh, was built with the eight inch high leg for making enough distance for camera lens uh, to the sole to get a good focus. I also get um, um, like a big help from my photo friends who helped me set up uh, remote live shooting software to adjust the focus on any kind of like, uh, like uh, a focus or light setting or different types of camera setting without me crawling into, um, you know, under table uh, or touching the uh, camera. And, um, at the end of session, each session, I share this uh, photo with my participant, and then they all said uh, that was the first time they actually saw their uh, bottom feet uh, with this much detail and information. And my shocking moment came when I printed the image for the first time on 42 by 42 size digital printing material um, because it's so big and 
so too much detail you can definitely tell the older lines and dry skins and uh um some like um uh uh what's that um uh some like uh we are uh, bumps at the on the soul so but i was very happy that to uh to see uh the image has some kind of shocking value since i was hoping this dynamic uh, large scale image could bring some attention to the gallery space and provide a counterpoint to the composition of casting on the floor. And these are the few from my casting sessions. Um, uh, some of my participants love to uh, take photos. So uh, it was kind of funny for, to see myself, uh, to, for, for me to see myself in there. But um, I, I also built a casting lounge with uh, an old lazy boy sofa uh, that I found uh, in Goodwill. And I actually set up on one of my working table to cast in people's fit. It helped, definitely helped my participants to stay comfortable during uh, two hours long, even sometime uh, uh, three hours long session uh, when they have a meeting. Um, and then we made a really good kind of interaction and uh, amazing story of, of, of their lives. And we are, we were not, not sharing, uh, we are not shy to share that kind of like, you know, uh, life experiences and, and stories. So that was amazing and also very, participative and um, um, performative uh, project for me to do. So the casting method that I have uh, used in, in Korea's traditional paper craft technique, which called the Jiho Kipbok, it is used to uh, cast from the existing form uh, or object. And it's very similar to paper mache process in Western craft practice. So I enjoy the possibility of a paper, um, different possibility of paper and thin layers of paper that allow me to replicate the folds and silhouette of the human form. This is the image of my uh, solo exhibition, Unapologetic. Uh, the show took place at the art gallery of the Studio Inc. In, in Kansas City in March of 2017. It was from an idea of creating an honest, uh, di direct, and organic, and humble, and most obviously unapologetic visual statement about my three years of grief uh, from my father's sudden death. I realized profound appreciation for um, human life uh, during my father's final stage. And it was an awakening moment as well uh, when I arrived at the place of loss without knowing anything. So I started making self figure um, in 2016 during my residency in Vermont Studio Center. And the idea of creating life-size cell figure came to me unexpectedly, but still uh, it felt urgent and uh, natural at that moment. So I decided not to judge my instinct uh, to tell, told, that tell, told me to draw myself for the first time in my art career. So um, I started sketching out a few poses that I felt uh, portray uh, my feelings and emotion very well and uh, photograph um, myself based off of those sketches that I made. And then I started drawing from the copy of the photographs. Even though I started um, from my sketches to initiate drawing, the camera lens uh, was the very important drawing tool for me to uh, um, kind of create this project to capture the moment of a storytelling. I completed nine drawing is total with graphite pencil on uh, about 15 long mylar and suspended them from the 13, 
fit high ceiling, uh, high gallery ceiling. I also installed the uh, LED tube light uh, behind each drawing to uh, drawings and, and turn off all the other lights in the gallery to make the uh, figures uh, look like floating in the, in, the, in the gallery space. I think I always have been struck and uh, kind of intrigued by human body that are appreciated and suffered and uh, marginalized, but truly lived. Sometimes I think our bodies are familiar yet terribly unfamiliar and they're comfortable for us to live in, but um, they are also deeply complicated to, uh, for us to live in as well. So when I, and also when I was working on this project, uh, the first Women's March happened in January of 2017. And um, I had been brought an extremely cynical and surreal and chaotic emotion, mainly for myself being an orphan after uh, my last parents passing, but also being in this country as an immigrant and of course as colored woman. I was experiencing uh, another significant loss in my life at the uh, moment of, uh, uh, so, uh, but still I believe that artists have a turn to their work to portray uh, feelings of anger and confusion and uh, fear, but hope and love, and to address the loss in the way that attempt to begin the healing process, how, however long it may take. These are, the, these are going to be my last slides, and uh, these are installation shots from uh, Tide from Regional Paper Roots um, uh, exhibition at Kemper Museum last year. Um, the, also, this will be the showing at the Women to Watch 2020 in October. Tide is an ongoing paper uh, foot casting project that I have been working for seven years and I wish to uh, continue creating more as my lifelong project. The idea of lifelong project started when I took down the exhibition, uh, Weight of Being, which I uh, show you previously, seven years ago. And I felt that project was somehow incomplete and wanted to make more uh, foot casts. So the casts are installed on the gallery wall to the floor and to create the theatrical representation of the human journey with uh, my hope of remembering us uh, as we walk together and march together through our history, even during a challenging times. And I hope this uh, installation reminds us of the belongings uh, and the closeness that we one's uh, privileged to have. The installation idea uh, started when the first woman's watch uh, march uh, happened in January 2017. And I started envision envisioning this uh, installation format to represent how this powerful march uh, and walking together uh, has been impacting not only uh, to the woman, but also all humans' life as we witness. So when the Tide uh, um, uh, had selected to exhibit in, in the uh, National Museum of Women in the, in the Art in, in October, was to uh, add a 30 pairs more to the show to create an extensive uh, installation and Jeannie and Orin love that idea so I scheduled the 30 casting uh, session for from the mid-March to April I think but the pandemic hit in the Kansas City and all over the world and lockdown order just occurred in the mid-March but thankfully I had some urgent feeling that I should 
cast people's feet uh, with plaster uh, in early March, right before the lockdown was implemented. So I made this. Uh, cast with plaster to uh, create uh, my paper cast uh, uh, out of that. So I was able to make uh, six pairs of the plaster cast. And also uh, I was able to make uh, 16 more pairs uh, out of those uh, pair, uh, ca uh, plaster cast. So, um, so I couldn't fulfill the 30, um, you know, more pairs, but I still, I'm, I feel very thankful to create like 60 more. So I think it's very uh, funny to find out the same pair uh, in the exhibition if we all uh, could be there in person um, in October. Okay, that's, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hei Young. That was um, that was really great. Your connection um, cut in and out just a little bit. So, um, but we didn't have any questions. So I think everybody got everything. Um, thank you for being so wonderfully um, candid with us about your your inspirations for your work. Um, I, I mean, everything you do is just so um, technically accomplished and so beautiful um, from your draftsmanship to your paper casting. Um, it's really a, a testament to your, your all around artistic skill. Um, we, we have a few questions um, and one of them had to do with, and, and I kind of was thinking along these lines as well when you were showing it, but in the, um, in the performance aspect of your installation, um, one of your first installations that, that featured feet, um, there, there are of course many different traditions and cultures in the wor world that um, ritualize foot washing. And probably um, in the Western world, a lot of us are most familiar with um, the foot washing that Christ did of his apostles at the Last Supper. And so uh, the question we had referred to that and asking if there's any kind of association there. Well, uh, I grew up as a Catholic and uh, foot washing ritual is one of the uh, like very important annual ritual that uh, church always uh, asks you to participate. So, and I always, I mean, there's so many different ritual um, in Catholic church, uh, but I think it is very, uh, I think that that ritual just kind of stuck with me uh, for a long time because that also related to my memory of my mother as well. Uh, but uh, I think that that foot ritual, foot washing ritual is a, one of the most uh, humble uh, practice that Jesus Christ actually did it for uh, his disciples and uh, that actually give send them to uh, uh, to love other other one without like uh, privileging of like a religious uh, authority or power so um, I always since the very young age I always felt like that ritual just kind of like a, gave us a, such a great lesson to uh, teach us how to love love each other and you know give the love uh, without you know uh, asking uh, rewards from it. So does it make any sense? Yeah, no, it, it really does. And I think that you've done a a beautiful job of highlighting this part of the body, like you said, often gets very overlooked and and mistreated and abused, and it's a it's very hum humble part of the body. That's and true. so I think, um, like you said, that's why it takes on such significance, um, you know, not only with, with washing of the feet, but also, you know, um, when, you're, when people prostrate themselves in front of a ruler or, you know, kiss the feet of the 
you know, back in the Middle Ages or whatever, that it's a sign of kind of humbling yourself. Um, and I just, you've captured that in, in such a beautiful way. Thank um, you. Another question we had, and it's a great question in looking at you right now because the one of the works behind you, I think, exemplifies this. Um, someone had a question about your use of negative space and the importance of negative space in your work. And so the, the work that's hanging behind you um, is one of the, the first works you showed us um, in the slide of you know, kind of looking down onto people's feet, but then the outline of that forms the head and, and the shoulders. And so I think clearly negative space is, is very important to you, but if, if you could just talk a little bit more about that. Right. Uh, yeah, that is a really good question. Um, I should have brought that up, but um, I forgot. Uh, <laughs> in in uh, I think Asian aesthetic, uh, like negative, I don't, I don't want to say negative, but white space is very important part of like uh, achieve the uh, pure beauty. So uh, when you when you see the Chinese drawing or painting, uh, they tend to leave a large portion of the or negative area or white area in their painting. They don't uh, eager to kind of fill up all whole area of like paper. Um, uh, with like too many elements, they love to uh, kind of like a leave it empty or leave it white to uh, kind of like a, a invite other people's thoughts or imagination. So that is kind of like a, it's more like a, they think that art is more like a meditation. So uh, it is very important for you to understand how this uh, negative space kind of a correspondent with the positive space. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I love, uh, I love relief block uh, carving mm -hmm. because you make white line. Technically you make a, you know, a white line by carving out something, not adding uh, right. something into the image. So uh, it, what, well, if you have any experience with the carving the block, it's very meditative. And, but you still have to be very focusing on how you can kind of create the empty space that actually uh, uh, kind of communicate very well with the positive space. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I always tend to leave some um, negative space for people to kind of like a, put in their own thoughts and put themselves in there to envision themselves in there. So I think that's kind of, my goal to creating more kind of like a participative art format than mm -hmm. just kind of showing and then let people uh, get my arts more passive way. Yeah. If, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. And I was also struck by your use of negative space um, in those life size drawings that you did, um, which had the effect of obviously really highlighting the body, um, but also creating some kind of narrative and leaving the viewer to imagine maybe what you're sitting on or what you're what you're pulling or pushing against. Right, and um, in that gallery space, um, I couldn't get the good kind of photo shot. But when people kind of travel around the uh, uh, drawings, uh, mylar has its own like a transparent quality. Mm -hmm. So people can see themselves in the drawing. Oh. Yeah, so it's kind of like a real figure of the pe people's body uh, and my drawing kind of overlap. Yeah. On the drawing, so I, I was really fascinated to kind of like see that uh, in person and people love to kind of like uh, 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 see themselves in the artwork. It's kind of like a, it's invitation to the artwork. Yeah. Yeah, so that was pretty amazing. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. But, but I, yeah. I can imagine that's hard to capture in a photo. Yeah, the, the place was so dark and everybody tried to capture the moment, but I think that's a kind of like a miracle or uh, I don't know, I don't want to say miracle. That's a little bit too religious, but um, unexpected uh, moment that you kind of like a only experience in the gallery space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
I um, I've had that moment um, unintentionally um, in museums when your reflection you can see a reflection in the glass that's over a painting like that's you know right. Hassan's painting or whatever and it's it, it's this wonderful moment of kind of like existing in the same coexisting yeah yeah the artwork and myself yeah that's true <laughs> well it just oh sorry let me check the again um we have another um question about um paper this one says paper seems to be an important medium with korean artists could you talk about that please and i think you you touched on that a little bit um but this also goes along with a question i had about the type of paper which i think is gampy paper that you're using to cast the feet. Um, yeah, so if you could just talk about the different types of paper that you use. Well, um, in Korean culture, paper is a very important uh, material, uh, not only for uh, creating a drawing or uh, writing, but also uh, it's, it, it was a big part of the architectural material as well. So we actually utilize, we actually until until like 20th century, uh, uh, the glass was kind of adopted and invented um, uh, in like late 19th century, and then our country kind of like imported, starting importing the glass. We always utilize the paper as as a uh, 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 as a part of a window instruction. So um, it's very how can I say it it's not just the the material that you uh kind of like a take out from a drawer to do something but it surrounded us mm -hmm. and uh we also use a really uh low quality paper to uh uh kind of seal the uh, floor of the house so it, it actually also paper carpet we actually leave on mm -hmm. as well yeah, it, it, it more looks like a kind of a linoleum, you know, uh, cover for the floor, but mm -hmm. we pasted like six or seven layers of like a, a very thick uh, Changji paper mm -hmm. uh, that has a very raw uh, color as well. It does, it does look like a little bit of like a brown paper, but mm -hmm. we just kind of like a keep pasting layers of layers of that with a really thick with paste to creating mm -hmm. a nice uh even uh and a soft uh you know paper is soft so uh soft to floor uh surface mm -hmm. so yeah well paper well the way of using a paper for korean mm -hmm. artists are much more kind of familiar and then um you know the history of like a, a inventing paper is very different from like uh, western to eastern so mm -hmm. our paper is plant-based paper, but uh, Western paper is based on uh, cotton. Mm -hmm. So it's much more kind of like a luxurious material. Mm -hmm. But in, in, in Asia, uh, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't popular until like 17th or 18th century, but still uh, it was a widely known uh, material for uh, many different, um, you know, uh, life uh, activities. So. Mm -hmm. I think that's why we wanted to um, work with the paper much more um, um, various way because we know the use kind of like, a, you know, function and possibility more mm -hmm. as we kind of grow up with that kind of culture. Yeah. yeah. It's so interesting. And um, that's, you know, one of the things that attracted Orin and I to paper as a medium and, and doing an exhibition to explore it because it is um, so ubiquitous. It's it's everywhere, and we That's use right. it in so many different ways. And we use it for, you know, it can be really disposable. You know, like paper towels yeah. and napkins, and of course that gets into ecological concerns. Um, or it can be very special. You know, writing a, a thank you note by hand right, right. Uh, on very nice stationery, and it's just really amazing to see how artists are approaching this material and all these 
I mean, just amazing, amazing it ways. Amazing, right. Yeah. I mean, I've been working with the paper for many years, but uh, I I saw many artists work throughout this, uh, you know, studio visit session, but it always got me wondering how they just control that much of the paper and kind of develop the skill that much and in that kind of like a meticulous way. So yeah, yeah. for me, it's yeah. also amazing as well. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We did have one more question about your gallery representation, um, but I know that Carolyn will send out a follow-up email to everyone um, with a link to your website and some other resources. So um, everyone who's attending can, oh, she just sent out the link to all the panelists. Um, yeah. Everyone can take a look at that on their own, but thank you again. And thank you also for uh, mentioning, as I forgot to do, I'm sorry, our, our Greater Kansas City Area Committee, which is so wonderful to us, um, especially Arlene Finney, and of course the wonderful Erin Jedic at the Kemper Museum, um, who I've worked with in the past and is just a wonderful colleague. And, um, you know, that's one of the things I love about this Women to Watch project is that it's so collaborative. Um, you know, we're working with our wonderful outreach committees. We're working with these great um, contemporary curators across the country and inter internationally as well. Um, so apologies that I, that I did not appropriately um, thank them in the beginning, but you, you reminded me. Um, so I, I think that's, that's everything and we'll wrap it up for the day and I'll um, say thank you once again to everyone for joining and to Hai Young, and I'll turn it back over to you, Carolyn. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Hai Young, for um, being with us today and, and taking the time to, to show us your work and, and show us your process. I think especially in the current world and atmosphere that we're in and, and being stuck at home forever, it seems like, um, getting to experience your work and, and hearing from you directly really makes it so special and it's very inspirational. So thank so thank you so much. And we can't wait to see it in person um, at the museum. Uh, and like Jenny said, I shared the, your website in the chat, but I'll also follow up with that uh, link in, the, in an email as well. Um, thank you, Jenny, for leading us today um, and a special thank you again uh, to the Greater Kansas City Area Committee and everything that you do with the museum and, and bringing us Hai Young and, and everything you've done for the Women to Watch series and to the rest of our committees as well. We thank you so much.